Hello, everybody, and welcome to the library. All right, no, that's fine. No, no, please, please. Thanks for coming out in the rain to hear uh, a great, important topic from a, a great presenter. My name is Ben Heckman. I'm the library director. It's great to have you all here. I want to take a few seconds of your attention to talk about some other great programs we have going on uh, next week, the Bexley Residential Design Update. So you can come and learn about the things that they change, and you can ask questions. Uh, on February 18th, we're doing a whole program on Toni Morrison. We're doing a whole day of celebration. We have multiple poets coming. It's going to be an amazing celebration of a great Ohioan. Uh, and then part two of the next chapter series with yours truly right here in the front row. We'll be back. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about that. For years, we had a program series called The Current. So if something major happened in the world or in our country, we'd get some experts up on the stage quickly to kind of break down what that was about, what was going on, let you ask questions about complex issues going on in our community and world. And so with all the growth and changes that we're having here in Columbus, uh, we were talking about a series where we could look at what's coming, what, what's happening, how is our community gonna change? Somebody thought it would be a great title called The Next Chapter because it's literary. I mean, I won't say it was me. <laughs> that may be the only thing I contributed to this, right, Zach? Uh, so the next chapter is a series for us to take a look at everything that's happening. And so I was talking to the mayor, and the mayor said, you got to talk to Michael Wilkos. He's incredible. We met with Michael Wilkos. He talked with us, at us, for an hour and 20 minutes. <laughs> And it was amazing, and we learned so much, and it was fascinating, and so I know that this is really great. So the two-part series, we're kicking off the next chapter. Uh, Michael's going to break down some of the history of Columbus and its growth, where some of the growth is going from here. And then from that, we're going to continue our partnership with the United Way and do a deep dive on the transportation and how it's going to change in Central Ohio. And housing and how it is going to be impacted by the growth we're having in education and environment. And I think as long as they'll have us, we're going to keep doing some more in-depth series. I'm excited as well because we're streaming this event and we're recording this event. So this is going to be widely available to everybody in the community. That's something we're very passionate about. Give it up for Zach Parrish over there on the ones and twos. He helped pull this program together and he is uh, recording it for us. So a quick note on that, um, tonight's program is hybrid. So if those of you online, welcome. If you have any questions, feel free to go ahead and put them in the chat. And if we'll take some questions here at the end, go ahead and raise your hand. We'll bring the mic over to you here in person. Uh, and so with that, I wanna introduce the other Ben in Bexley, Mayor Ben Kessler, to introduce our presenter. Thank you, other Ben. Ben Heckman. Woo! Is he not the best library director? That's a great title. Well done. You've yes. earned your, your wages right. for the year. <laughs> so I don't want to oversell Michael Wilkos, oh, no. but you're going to be blown away by this presentation. Oh. I get the distinct privilege of sitting through presentations a lot in our region about housing and demographic trends. And I have to say, some of them are less exciting than this one. It's going to knock your socks off. Oh, boy. I want to... Re <laughs> if it doesn't, full refund. Just right. see uh, Ben Heckman afterwards. <laughs> I want to recognize uh, we have a couple council members with us this evening. Council member Monique Lampke, our president of council. Alex Silverman, a uh, new council member here. And uh, we also have with us uh, our hot off the press, brand new... Director of Administration and Development, Megan Meyer. Megan, right over here. Um, I, I, I'm gonna leave as soon as I introduce Michael Wilkos, and it's because I'm headed to the Board of Zoning and Planning where we are uh, talking about an ordinance that ties directly into what Michael's presentation is about tonight. It talks about uh, further modernizing Bexley zoning to be more accessible to all. So I encourage you to keep track of that. Our public hearing is at Council on February 13th. But we're really here not to hear me, but to hear Michael Wilkos. And we're lucky to have somebody as tireless and knowledgeable, and he's tireless because he's all over the region right now uh, presenting, and he's tailored this presentation for us tonight. He's been coordinating this series throughout the city. He's the Senior Vice President of Community Impact at United Way of Central Ohio. 
His team develops effective strategies to improve our communities, such as the education and outreach that we're gonna experience here tonight. Prior to joining United Way, Michael was the Director of Community Research at the Columbus Foundation. During his tenure there, he initiated, led, and managed more than $9 million in competitive grant making to support community revitalization holistically in Wineland Park, an effort to stabilize and revitalize a mixed income community near the Ohio State University. Before working at the Columbus Foundation, I'm not supposed to say that part, oh, okay. but he was back at the United Way, so he really basically is a rock star. Please join me in welcoming the Michael Wilkos. Oh, Lord. Thank you. Well, see, I always like it when people undersell, right? So uh, good evening, and thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Ben 2.0, for this opportunity to chat with you this evening. An hour on census data on a rainy night in January, right? How fun is that? So by further introduction, I did not grow up in Columbus, and I developed a childhood fascination with the city. In 1980, I got the almanac as a 13-year-old, and I'm reading through the almanac, and I find there's one place in the whole state that's growing, and it was Columbus. Now, where did I grow up? Youngstown. What was happening in 1980? The close of the seal mills. Oh yeah, the guy in the back, he's like, Durr. right? And so at 13, I'm starting to pay attention to the world around me. And the world around me was dramatic, right? Unemployment rate in Mahoning County skyrockets to 25%. The mills are closing. It's not a good time. And so I approach the journalism teacher at my high school newspaper, and I say, I want to write an article encouraging everybody to move to Columbus when they finish high school. <laughs> and she's like, uh, yeah, I don't know there's really a need for that in a high school newspaper. And I was so upset that I got blocked with this amazing idea. I took an ad out in my high school newspaper in 1985, advertising Columbus. So I've been working on this for 39 years. <laughs> and I hope you like it. And if you don't, I don't care. <laughs> so why would United Way be here to talk about central Ohio changes? So my educational background at Ohio State was in geography and a master of city and regional planning. And I really think of the nonprofit sector as the social mortar between the bricks and sticks. Right? It's the glue that ties a lot of people together. And what I have learned in my 20 years as a grant maker is people are feeling really nervous right now. And so by a show of hands, how many of you grew up as a kid in Franklin County? Okay. How many of you grew up somewhere else in the state? Ah, bigger number. And what about somewhere else in the US? Wow, that was actually the smallest number of people in the room are Columbus born. Uh, anybody outside the US? I knew it. Where? Can't, okay, good for you. My mother was a Canadian citizen. So. Uh, so, when the census data came out, I curated a presentation to help the nonprofits really understand that. And it was an online presentation, and 400 people tuned in to watch it. And it just kept kind of growing. And so, when I met with folks at the library, when the mayor heard it, uh, we curated tonight's conversation. So, what am I going to do? Uh, and who is United Way? We've been around for 100 years. We fund 91 nonprofits. They're entirely in the space of basic needs, food, hunger, homelessness, and student success, kindergarten readiness, social emotional learning to make sure kids finish high school. But where are those nonprofits located? They're located in neighborhoods experiencing incredible change. So when I put this presentation together, in my mind, the audience was, staff at nonprofits so they understand why it's so hard for them to do their job. The boards of those nonprofits so they can set policy and direction. And then we were providing the presentation to corporate organizations and donors. And it's just kind of grown from there because you're all here because you're interested in the future of Central Ohio. So I got one more pop quiz survey. By a show of hands, how many of you feel more optimistic about the future of Central Ohio than you do about the future of our country right now? Look at that. OK. How many of you saw this? What, what, what was that? Is Steve Heiser causing a problem already? All right. Well, the wife of Steve Heiser, condolences, ma'am, for dear. No. Great guy. Okay, how many of you saw this 1991 movie with Ed Begley Jr. and Stockard Channing? Oh my God, you saw it? Almost nobody has seen it, because it bombed at the box office. But what do you see about this picture? It's a family. It's 
family of insects. It's a human family. But the origin story is they are, in fact, a family of insects in the Amazon rainforest. And they're very upset in American behavior that's contributing to global warming. Ed Begley Jr., he's been an environmentalist for a long time. Stockard Channing's his wife. They live in the suburbs. Kids could get Bs in school, not Cs, not Ds. They've got a dog. And he's trying to figure out how are they going to dismantle American energy plants. They have to be undetectable. So they have to blend into American society. And they want to be as average as they can be. In the beginning of the movie, do you remember the scene? In the beginning of the movie, he's going through census data. And Ed Begley Jr. says, aha, Columbus, Ohio is the most average place in America. <laughs> And this movie takes place in a fictitious Columbus suburb called, wait for it, Median, Ohio. <laughs> Which, by the way, looked like Bexley in the movie, right? OK, that's what we were known for a long time. That's why we were a test market. The first ATM was here. Cable television started here. The first gas station. The whole idea was, if it would sell in Columbus, we could take it national. What I want to do with you this evening is bring us to a common understanding of the city we now share, what did we just go through in the last decade? I'm going to focus on housing and some of the economic vulnerability. And when we get to the end, I'm going to give you four things that I'm really excited about, despite most of the presentation, which is going to be a bit sobering. Start with this quote. Longtime Chicago Tribune columnist, our dilemma is that we hate change and we love it at the same time. The real challenge is, can things remain the same but get better? This room is optimistic. A lot of rooms I go to aren't. So the feeling is, could Central Ohio be getting better for me, but not getting better for my neighbor? And what does that mean? It's usually the high housing costs that are giving people uh, consternation. This is what's driving that. In the last 12 years, we have added 263,000 people. And while that is true for Central Ohio, the rest of the state lost 20,000 people. We are the economic engine of the state. About a 25-mile radius of broad and high is that economic engine. It's a very different state outside of this region. Even when you look at how central Ohio is voting in political elections relative to the rest of the state, that's another example of how we are changing differently than the rest of the state. If you look at the growth of our metropolitan region on an annual basis with each year, one of the things you'll see is that the growth of central Ohio is ticking upward, but not significantly. For those of us that live and work in Franklin County, it feels like Columbus is growing so much more faster than it used to, and here's why. If you look at that second from the right column, between 2000 and 2010, just 43% of the growth of the metropolitan region happened in Franklin County. After 2010, the growth of the region dramatically started to move inward, where 70% of all of the growth of the metro happened in Franklin County, or said another way, 73% of the population growth of the state of Ohio since the year 2010 is this county. Here's the city of Columbus. Now 906,000 people. The city just had its fastest rate of growth in 70 years, measured in a numeric way. It was the largest numeric increase in a decennial census ever recorded in Columbus history. For a city in Ohio in the Midwest to have its fastest increase in population between 2010 and 2020, pretty rare. In fact, Columbus grew faster than every city on this slide. Columbus growth was faster than Houston, Nashville, Dallas, Phoenix. The metropolitan regions grew faster than our metropolitan region, but their core city didn't grow faster than our core city. And given that I've worked for United Way of Central Ohio and I'm focused on economic mobility, and we serve people at 200% of the federal poverty level or below, that's a single person who makes $25,000 a year or less. And 400,000 people in Franklin County live at that income level. So think about OSU Stadium. You could fill that building four times to capacity with residents of Franklin County who really struggle to put food on their table. If you didn't know this about Columbus, and I see a few familiar faces in the room that do, Randy Black, that Columbus was the first city ever to be created by an active state legislature. There was no city here. But Columbus has had what to its advantage? Annexation. And the city of Columbus has been annexing and annexing to the point of today. The city of Columbus is the exact same square miles as the city of Chicago. The city of Columbus is in 11 different school districts 
of the 16 school districts in the county, and Columbus is in three counties. So what do you notice about this crazy map? Columbus has five suburbs entirely surrounded by the city, right? Bexley, Whitehall, Grandview, Arlington, and Worthington. But for 70 years, Columbus has kind of had a policy. It doesn't want any two suburbs to touch. So Columbus wedged itself between Dublin and Hilliard. That line right there is the Delaware County, Franklin County line. That's all Polaris. Olentangy Schools, Delaware County. But every single person that works at that J.P. Morgan Chase facility pays their income tax to 90 West Broad. This is where the city annexed to get down to pick up the jobs at Rickenbacker. And right there on Morse Road, Columbus is 50 feet wide between Gahanna and New Albany. But that has now ended. The city of Columbus is no longer on this territorial expansion. Starting with Mayor Coleman, it was let's grow outward with a plan, inward with a passion. And those tentacles that you saw are becoming more and more difficult to serve. In the last decade, the land area barely budged, but we had to squeeze a modest sized city into those boundaries. And there isn't a single neighborhood that was unchanged by what just happened. Columbus is going vertical. Why? Land prices, housing costs can justify this verticality. You see these projects going up behind COSI in the Franklinton area in the Soda Peninsula. You see these projects happening in urban neighborhoods near downtown, changing the conversation on scale and density and parking. You also see it in the suburbs. If you look at the picture in the top right, that's Dublin's Bridge Park. It replaced a single story strip mall that had about a 15 year run. And as they've redeveloped that site, it's five and six and seven story apartments, condos, hotels, and office buildings. Think about Dublin. It went from 3,800 people to 50,000 in 30 years. It has a relatively typical housing stock of nice homes in suburban subdivisions. But there's a lot of people that have moved to Dublin over the last couple decades. They no longer want that 3,500 square foot home in Muirfield Village. They love living in Dublin, but there's not the housing diversity in Dublin that now supports their empty nester lifestyle. What is Bridge Park? That's about convenience. It's about being able to go on four or five vacations a year, not having yard work, not having house maintenance. If we're talking about the four, five, and six story buildings on High Street and West Broad and Long Street, that's about lifestyle for single people who haven't gotten married, who haven't started to have children. In many ways, our built environment is being reshaped, and it is nothing more complicated than convenience and lifestyle supported by demographic shifts of who are the Columbus households, and it's reinventing the built environment right before our eyes. If you start at the bottom of this slide, look at what happened in growth in America. Growth in the United States slowed from 9.7 to 7.4%. It was the slowest growth rate in America since the Great Depression. Growth in America slowed by 28 percentage points. Go to the top of the slide. Right as growth in America was slowing, growth in the city of Columbus accelerated. Growth in Franklin County, the next line accelerates. All of the increase for the state of Ohio was us. We also now have the most evenly distributed growth we've ever seen in decades. As we all know, what has the growth corridor been in central Ohio for a long time? Hilliard, Dublin, Powell, New Albany, over to Gahanna. This is the most evenly distributed we've seen. We now have high growth inner ring suburbs like Grandview Heights, which chose to repurpose industrial land for mixed use development called Grandview Yard. You see high growth places like Grove City and Canal Winchester. Everybody is growing. Bexley, Whitehall. So much so, Whitehall's growing for the first time in 50 years. And we're going to get a little bit more into that here in a few minutes. To put this in perspective, since 2010, Franklin County was adding 44 people every single day. And on an annual basis, that means about 16,000 additional people. You know the population of Bexley. It would be like Columbus, Franklin County having to build the entire city of Worthington every 12 months. The challenge is we've only been building housing for 11,000 people. Every single year for a decade, we got 5,000 more people in this community, and nobody put anywhere for them to put their head on a pillow at night. What is driving our growth? 50% of it is more births minus deaths. We have a very young median age in central Ohio, which means regardless of economic conditions, we're going to grow because our families are expanding here relative to the country. 
That's the largest part of our growth. 26% are people moving here from another country. That's a new phenomenon. But the smallest amount of our growth at just 24% are people moving here from another place in the United States. Most of that growth is coming from, still, Cleveland, Dayton, Akron, Detroit, Youngstown. And when you leave Columbus, it's often Phoenix, Houston, Dallas, Charlotte, Atlanta. In many ways, Columbus is on a ladder up and out of Ohio. What are the two reasons why people have always moved since people have lived in civilizations? Push factors, pull factors. Push factors, war, famine, persecution. Pull factors, jobs, education. What are we? We're a job center and we're an education center. So we're importing talent. Talent stays. When they leave Columbus, they leave Ohio, and they leave the Midwest, for the most part. There's going to be a little change in that. Fastest growth in 70 years, largest numeric increase ever recorded. The white population in the city of Columbus fell for the first time in history in real numbers. That is also now a true statement for Franklin County. That's how quickly we're changing as a community. Here are, here's the data for the county. I'm not going to read it. It's not statistically significant that the white population fell by just 3,000 people, but relative to every other racial group, that is significant. Some of this is because there are people who are going through a journey and they say, I don't like these labels. And people may have previously identified as white alone, who now they think some other race or two or more races is a more appropriate description of who they are. Even with that acknowledgment of some shifting, this is a pretty significant change for us. The census also has acknowledged the spring of 2020 was not a good time to do a census. And they, <laughs> uh, they believed they got the top line number right. But in their statistical methodology, they believe that they overcounted white and Asian America, undercounted black and Hispanic. This would be that census methodology correction. So really, the white population of Franklin County might have fallen more like 16,000 than the 3,000 officially recorded. When the Census Bureau goes back to do its own fact checking, they don't change the original count, but they can acknowledge that there's some nuances. I share that with you because part of this presentation is about the diversification of our region. It's probably even more diverse than what has been officially recorded. You only have to look at the enrollment in the school districts over the last 15 years to see how significantly you were changing. This is the workforce for Central Ohio. One of the things you see is Bexley, Arlington, and Grandview were kind of parsed out. Why were they parsed out? Their school district boundaries and political jurisdictions line up. The other one that does that is Whitehall, which is having an opposite experience right, when it comes to change in diversity. And while Bexley, Arlington, and Grandview are getting more diverse, not getting more diverse particularly with African American, but getting more diverse with other racial categories. We also know that Central Ohio has been the attraction for foreign born. While we're just less than 4% of Ohio was born outside the United States, it's more like over 8% for Central Ohio. When you look at Franklin County in particular, the vast majority of new Americans that live within the metropolitan region are choosing Franklin County as their place of residence. Here are the countries of origin that are the largest places of origin for new Americans in central Ohio. You'll see that about 41% comes from Mexico, Somalia, India, China, and Bhutan. What's interesting about the new American population here, it really started to change in the 1990s. It was quite organic. Columbus is considered a second tier emerging market when it comes to new Americans. Typically, a market our size that's an inland city would typically see that flow coming from a single continent of origin. So in Charlotte and Indianapolis, it's very heavily coming from Latin and Central America. We have a much more diverse country of origin that looks much more like a highly developed immigrant destination like a New York, a Miami, or Los Angeles. That's driven by the companies that are here. It's driven by the Ohio State University. But it's also driven by, in my opinion, we have a very large LGBT community, and we have a large Muslim Somali community. Those are two communities that don't hang out a lot. Why are they both attracted to Central Ohio? In my opinion, it's because they feel appreciated, welcomed, and respected. And when cultures are feeling persecuted, you go to places where you feel more welcome. And Central Ohio has really had that as part of our DNA for a while. 
The other thing I thought was fascinating as I was doing some look at New American data, I thought it was fascinating that 26% of residents of Central Ohio who were not born in the United States have a lower percentage of folks using Medicaid or Medicare. And by the way, new Americans in Franklin County have the highest labor force participation rate of any demographic. The other thing is, across our country, about a quarter of new Americans in the United States have been here 10 years or less. A quarter of ours have been here five years or less. We have a newer new American population than the rest of the country. It's a newer trend for us. Here is the geography of the new American population, and some things would line up with your understanding of Central Ohio. The west side, near the Ohio State University, the whole Bethel sawmill toward Dublin corridor. Northland is exploding, but also the east suburbs from Whitehall further out. And you may know that Reynoldsburg has the first Nepali Bhutanese elected to public office in the United States. Here's again the map of the county. The population's up 14%, up 160,000. I want to point out a few things. For all the years as being a little kid in Youngstown looking at census maps, I could make some clear assessments. If a neighborhood's gaining population, that must mean a neighborhood that people are attracted to. If a neighborhood's losing people, they must be moving away from something they don't like. You can no longer make that interpretation because our housing market is so challenged. Here are two places. In red, we see significant population loss from COSI running out Sullivan Avenue and West Broad from COSI to Hollywood Casino. Every neighborhood is losing households, housing units, and population as the West Side can't seem to dig out from under social ills, particularly the opioid epidemic. Another collection of neighborhoods losing people is right here. And that's Nationwide Children's. That line is Parsons Avenue. So Miller, Kelton, Whittier, Parsons, all of the neighborhoods running south of Children's Hospital are also losing people. Not because the south side is on the decline, but it's on the rapid rise. And renter families with school-aged children are being displaced by new homeowners, and the new homeowner is often a single individual, so the number of people per unit is dropping. And yet, what you're gonna see here in a few minutes, we have neighborhoods that are exploding with more people, even though the neighborhood is getting weaker and poorer. That's also a new trend for us. So we have neighborhoods losing people as they're on the rise, and you're gonna see neighborhoods gaining people as they're on the decline. That relationship has changed. The other thing that is important for us to take hold of is the role that systemic racism and oppression really continue to play. If you look at who's experiencing economic progress in Franklin County through the lens of race, you'll see that there is a pretty significant gap. If all of the population growth of Columbus and Franklin County is through diversity, and we don't course correct structural racism and oppression, we are in fact a weaker community because we can't get over those historic systems. We can make a moral case for equity, and we can make a business case for equity. I don't care which one you pick. Just pick one and let's get on with it, right? So everywhere is getting more diverse. Here is the map in green that shows the increase in diversity since 2010. Inner ring suburbs, inner ring neighborhoods, beltway suburbs, everybody got more diverse. Despite that, we're not living in an integrated way. In red, shows all the geography where people are living in racial isolation. Let's ignore a lot of this. It's south of Grove City, it's mostly farms, very few people live there, we wouldn't expect it to be diverse. So what are the most racially homogeneous places in 2020? Bexley, German Village, Grandview through Arlington, Clintonville, and Worthington. What's fascinating when I saw this map, and thank you Columbus Dispatch for your maps, homogeneity can be in the city of Columbus in the Columbus School District, and it can be in the suburbs. But I think there's been a lot of pop culture that believes that suburbs are homogeneous and cities are diverse. It's really not true anymore. Of the most homogeneous places, they were really built with redlining and restrictive covenants that prohibited people of color from living there when they were built originally, and 80, 90 years later, they're really not budging. Yet, if you look at Dublin in the top left, over towards New Albany, they're very wealthy, they're very homogeneous economically, but they're quite diverse culturally and linguistically, so much so that Dublin schools are only 59% white at this point. 
The zoning code basically ensures that Dublin is gonna be high income, but because New Albany and Dublin have been built entirely after fair housing laws, they look different than Arlington and Grandview and Worthington. So when we look at growth in central Ohio, these are the fastest growing places. Three of them were farm fields that became development, and three of them were existing neighborhoods near the urban core. So of the six fastest growing places, it is now evenly distributed between existing neighborhoods rechanging their built environment and the traditional suburban development. But all six of them are in the city of Columbus uh, political jurisdiction. Now we know that downtown Columbus has surged. Every downtown in the United States has seen a similar experience. Ours was much broader than that. If you look at this shaded area, so starting at Grandview Yard, the 5th by Northwest corridor of 5th Avenue and King Avenue on the other side of Olentangy River Road, Italian Village, Wineland Park, downtown King Lincoln, we saw a 44% surge of people moving inward. And what were the demographics of those folks? White, young, and childless. I believe the shaded area has kind of filled up and land prices have gotten quite high. So where is that momentum of that demographic push coming inward gonna go in the next decade? It's absolutely going out east broad, and it's gonna go out west broad. And you see it now in Franklinton, if you uh, read Columbus Business First or the Dispatch, now there's a proposal for a 15-story tower to replace Spaghetti Warehouse in Franklinton. There are a series of mid-rises and into high-rises that are now popping up all over Franklinton. It could be by 2020, Franklinton is gonna be a mid-rise neighborhood that you see in a lot of other growing markets of our size. So now let's go into some neighborhoods. Linden is now a growing neighborhood. 11 of the 12 census tracts along that Cleveland Avenue corridor. So Cleveland Avenue is kind of running right up here. There's Westerville Road. Here's Interstate 71. This is actually the fairgrounds. That's the Ohio State University campus. 11 of the 12 census tracts are now growing in Linden. Linden is now growing for the first time in 60 years. I was so happy to see these numbers because one of my first jobs working for the city of Columbus after grad school was working in Linden. And I was impressed that Linden could absorb 2,600 additional residents. The city of Columbus just opened a $51 million rec center. That was a physical representation of the city's commitment to Linden. But as I started to go a little deeper into the data, I was like, oh, uh-oh, ruh -oh. Linden's growing not because it's become a neighborhood of opportunity, but because people can't afford to live anywhere else. Those 91 nonprofits we fund at United Way, they've been telling us the same message for years. People are living doubled up. As people get evicted, they don't know where to go. And if you're living doubled up, where is that happening? Already disadvantaged neighborhoods. People aren't doubling up in the short north or German village or Worthington. They're living doubled up in neighborhoods like this. So in Linden, the population's up 2,600, but it lost 4% of its entire housing stock. I've never, in all the years looking at this data, seen neighborhoods that are growing as they're losing housing units. This is gonna be a theme that you're gonna see. There are 1,100 less vacant houses in Linden than there were in 2010, and what do you see about Linden's houses? They're small, they're simple. It's not the big 3,500 square foot house on the Near East Side on Mount Vernon Avenue that takes a lot to renovate. These are pretty simple to bring back. And the city of Columbus was focused on blight remediation, and 400 abandoned houses were demolished. So I'm gonna do some math here. 1,100 less vacant structures, 400 demolitions. That suggests about 700 vacant properties did what? Came back online. And through Columbus Dispatch Analysis, we know that those properties are not getting renovated because a resident of Linden is buying the abandoned house, renovating it, and building wealth equity for the next generation. It's real estate investment companies that are able to pencil on paper investment in housing resources in Linden and they can get the revenue back out. Why is Linden growing? Because the housing market is so strained, the growth of the region's moving inward, we're not building enough housing. If housing costs are rising faster than your income, one way to deal with that, have more people in the home to pay for it. What is that doing in Linden? Ruh row again. Here are two examples of houses at Cleveland Avenue and 11th between Cleveland Avenue and Columbus Metropolitan Housing Authority's Rosewind. If it's a quarter of a million dollars to live in Linden, where's the average worker gonna go? Northland. Interstate 71 on the left, there's 270. That squiggly line is Alum Creek, so Easton sits here. There is Morse, there's 161, there is Carl. 
Every single neighborhood in Northland is adding people. Every single census tract. In fact, Northland added the entire city of Bexley into its boundaries in 10 years. 13,700 people moved into one Columbus neighborhood in a decade, and they only added 484 housing units. That's the entire city of Bexley moving into one apartment complex. Well, that didn't happen, right? What did happen? What did happen is Northland was the epicenter of the reduction in vacant and abandoned housing. 48% of all the vacant housing in Northland disappeared just like that. What you see here is a picture taken from Google Street View in 2010 of an entire apartment complex on Northtown Boulevard near Tamarack Circle where the developer just walked away from the whole apartment complex, boarded it up. Housing market collapses in 2006, 7, 8. Northland's a weak neighborhood and a weak housing ecosystem, so you just walk away from product. Go to Google Street View for 2020, that apartment complex is back, right? That's paint and carpet, that was a simple renovation. So while the number of housing units inched up 1%, the number of occupied houses went up seven, but the population's up 15. And during this explosion of people, Kroger, Giant Eagle, and Meyer all left the neighborhood. What's that about, right? In 1997, Morse Road had the greatest volume of retail sales of any zip code in the entire state of Ohio. 10 years later, that was over. Lazarus, J.C. Penny, and Sears went up to Polaris, TJ Maxx goes out to Easton, and a local geographer pulled every business permit issued by the city of Columbus in the eight years after Northland Mall closed, and almost all of those new businesses were started by either someone with an African or Latino surname. Morse Road is more local, more entrepreneurial than anywhere else in the region, and it has a commercial vacancy rate that is non-existent. So as Meyer, Kroger, and Giant Eagle, in my opinion, probably couldn't respond quick enough to the demographic changes, and a store manager probably doesn't have the flexibility to change the items on those shelves fast enough, their business model didn't work. In the closure of their business model, Saraga, right, Global Mall, all kinds of places filled that gap. Why is Northland and Linden behaving this way? because they are surrounded in every direction by a major job center, and Easton, Polaris, the airport, OSU, and downtown are all gaining jobs. So again, if the growth of the metropolitan region is moving inward, we're not building enough housing, and you're in a neighborhood with vacant housing surrounded by job centers that are adding jobs, would we expect Northland and Linden to not behave the way they are? And yet, Hamilton Road, Kimberly Parkway, toward Gender Road, not doing so great. Sullivan Avenue, West Broad Street, not doing so great. Why? In my opinion, it's because there's no employment bookend. There's nothing holding the city together on that southeast side, and the casino on the west side was too small, it was poorly designed, and it hasn't had economic development spill over. In, since 2010, 30 people moved into Northland for every one housing unit that was built, and in Linden, four people moved into that neighborhood for every one housing unit that was lost. Bookends are important. Here's a cartoon from Billy Ireland, and if you've not been to the Billy Ireland Cartoon Museum, it's awesome, right? Yeah. Um, this was a cartoon he did in the 1920s where he predicted the short north. Read that quote. High Street could be set up as a village of shops, studios, coffee houses, tea rooms, etc. Wonderful place of possibilities. How did Billy Ireland know what the Short North was destined to be? I think it's because he understood what bookends were. He knew that the Ohio State University and downtown weren't going to go anywhere, right? So I don't want to discredit all of the hard work that went into the Short North, but market conditions wanted that to happen. What's another neighborhood with bookends? Near East Side. What are the bookends? Bexley and downtown. Both of those are pretty stable bookends that if I'm interested in buying a dilapidated house on the Near East Side, I've got confidence I'm between these two really strong bookends that are going to support my investment. Interestingly enough, the population on the Near East Side barely increased because it was still losing people for the first part of the decade. What's more important about this small growth 
is the University of Minnesota Economic Opportunity looked at age, income, and mobility patterns, and what they discovered about the Near East Side was while the population's up 550, they lost 1,100 children, and they lost 1,600 seniors, but gained 3,100 adults. So what does that suggest? When neighborhoods start kicking out children and kicking out seniors, but absorbing workers, that says this neighborhood is no longer an organic place that is responding to people of different religions and cultures and ages and incomes. Now it's people who are responding to the housing market. And children and seniors aren't in the labor market and they can't contribute to those housing costs so the neighborhood doesn't really need them like it used to. In 1970, the short north had just as many school-aged children as any Columbus neighborhood. By 1990, they were almost entirely gone. That phenomenon really started to take off on the Near East Side in the last 10 years because the demographics of the people living there are responding to the housing market. It's also the most significantly changing racially. The white population is surging from 19 to 37%. The black population is plummeting. If you live on the Near East Side, you have a completely opposite opinion of what you think is happening across the city. And of course, the housing market is responding. There's 1,200 less vacant houses on the Near East Side than 10 years ago. As housing consumers became so kind of desperate to get housing anywhere, they started to pick up housing and vacant lots in places they might not have looked five years earlier. And this is what's happening to a selection of properties that I picked just near Nationwide Children's Hospital. If you look at that house in the top right, that little bungalow went from $154,000 to $270,000 in 90 days. I know, what? I like this, I knew I was gonna like the Bexley crowd. <laughs> if you look at this home in the center, that went from $123,000 to $340,000 in 120 days. That could be a great example of what might have been a rental home with a family with school-aged children an investor buys it, flips it, stages it with restoration hardware. How many of you like just lay on your iPad on the couch and look at Zillow, right? <laughs> and you're like, oh, I know that kitchen tile, right? I know that bathroom fixture. I see it a lot, right? This is an example of how that neighborhood could be losing people as the value of the neighborhood is rapidly rising. If you look at nearby Whitehall, fascinating transformation. In the, in the last decade, Whitehall lost 3.5% of all of its housing units, but added 11.4% more people. Crazy. The housing vacancy rate in Whitehall was almost 15% in 2010. By 2020, it was down to 5.4. For every seven people who moved into Whitehall, they lost one housing unit year after year. And what's happening in Whitehall is the same thing happening near Children's, same thing happening at Cleveland and 11th. Look at the house on the left, from $20,000 to 250 in not very long time. And then as you get closer to the country club, where you have very nice homes in Whitehall, there you also see similar appreciation rates. When we look at Bexley, right, you've got three census tracts. There is population growth in all of them, so it's not as if there's one part of Bexley that's growing and the other parts are stable. You see relatively evenly distributed population growth. Bexley is changing slightly, but the rate of racial change here is lagging the rest of the community. Bexley is more like a Grandview and an Arlington and a Worthington than it is like a New Albany and a Dublin because of those historic systems of how the community was rooted and the strong percentage of people who want to continue to be repeat buyers generationally, decade after decade. Arlington is taking that on because the city manager of Arlington says people love Arlington, they love growing up there, young people move away, they go to other big cities, they come back, they want to be in Arlington, but they want their children to have a more diverse experience. So the lack of diversity in Arlington is starting to work against them long term, and they're looking at how do they become a different community and there's groups in Arlington called Equal UA that are trying to look at how do they repair some of those systemic systems and the popularity of people wanting to stay there. If you want to stay there in Grandview and Arlington, what that means is those houses are going off the market so fast because a friend or family member is connecting you 
And if the community is almost all white, who do you think the connections are to more white people? All right. Bexley also saw an increase in occupied units. Bexley, like the rest of the community, saw a decrease in vacant housing. Uh, when we look at diversity, the diversity index, you also see right, that there is an increase in the diversity index for the entire community. We saw an increase of 10 points. When we look at some of the demographics, how does Bexley compare to Franklin County? It does compare in some ways, right? The white population in Bexley had the same experience as the white population in the county. The African American population's on the rise in Bexley, not on the same rise as the rest of the county, and the numbers are small. Other demographic groups are kind of trending similar to the rest of Franklin County. And then even in Bexley, you saw a reduction in the housing vacancy rate, which was already relatively low. It's fascinating now that Bexley and Whitehall have a housing vacancy rate that's only one percentage point different. Where 10 years ago, the vacancy rate in Whitehall was 100% greater than the vacancy rate in Bexley. That difference has eroded. If you look at Bexley, there were 2.8 people living in every housing unit in 2010. Now there are three people living in every housing unit in Bexley. In places like Linden, it went from 2.2 to 2.6. Same thing in Northland. Every single decade since the end of World War II, there have been fewer and fewer people living in the typical American housing unit. That trend has stopped and reversed itself because of the increase in housing costs. And then lastly, in Bexley, for every nine additional people that moved in, you lost a housing unit. What's interesting about that is you didn't lose housing because of demolition, right? It was lost through either conversion. You might have seen a duplex get converted to a single. I don't know Bexley well enough. I'm just sharing with you the data that comes from the US Census. And then, of course, without getting into the details, when Bexley is responding to these lifestyle and demographic shifts, as Bexley is looking to change its housing typology to respond to the changing demographics of who we are, that causes consternation, right? We want things to remain the same, but get better. Will this project make Bexley better, or are there risks that would make it worse? That has conflict. All right. Leaving that, going back to the whole county. In red, you see where the black and African American population is on the decline, and after 2010, there was a significant movement of black households out of the central city, and particularly, you'll see a pattern here in a minute of where that's going. Greatest drop in the black population was Franklinton. What you see here is the exact same picture taken two years or 10 years apart. The decade started with the housing authorities, Riverside, Bradley. 10 years later, it's Castos, River, and Rich and the black population in that part of Franklinton fell by 61%. Here is where the black population of Franklin County is going. It's a development by MI Homes called Upper Albany West. More black and African American households move there than anywhere else in Franklin County, but three census tracts in the city of Columbus, all adjacent to the city of New Albany, saw the greatest movement. This is the movement of the black middle class to suburbia, and it is so pronounced New Albany High School now has an official NAACP chapter as 10% of New Albany High School students identify as black alone. If you look at this pattern, here is the black population in 1960. Again, we're not gonna spend too much worry about that geography because this area of shaded orange has the same number of people living in it as that right there. Does anybody know what that is at Alum Creek and Livingston? Hanford Village. Right. Sounds like a lot of people know Hanford Village. But in 1960, there's Broad, here's Bexley, and there's where 670 was about to be. As recently as 1960, most black residents were on the Near East Side. Here we have 1980. What was going on between that period? Busing. The Supreme Court case was filed in 1973. Buses rolled for the 79, 1980 school year. And in the seven years between when that was filed, litigated, decided, and buses ran, 37,000 children left the Columbus School District. There is a 1980 Columbus Monthly article that's 22 pages, and it essentially says it's over for Columbus City Schools. They will probably not recover because the real root of this was the housing system, and that's not getting addressed. Here we have 2,000. The vast majority of black residents are still within the Beltway. We get to 2020. It was after the year 2000 that you started to see a significant migration of black households, Westerville, Gahanna, Pickerington, Canal Winchester. 
That is the railroad track that runs along Interstate 71, and it has been the race demarcation line for a long time. There's two places where that doesn't hold true. Right here, it's getting less, uh, less color on the map. That are white households leaving Clintonville, Beechwold, Old North Columbus, because they can't afford those prices. They're jumping into North Linden around Oakland Park Nursery. And some people are starting to rebrand those decisions by calling them what? East Clintonville. That, by the way, should put the hair up on your arms, if it didn't already. And then, what do you see here? This area is the only area to the west of the railroad track. Because by show of hands, how many of you have been to Cameron Mitchell's Bud Dairy Food Hall? Anybody in the room who hasn't heard me before know how Bud Dairy went out of business? Mm, I love the story. I love hearing myself tell the same story over and over. <laughs> the Ku Klux Klan had their conference at the Ohio Fairgrounds. And Bud Derry took an ad out in their program brochure to advertise a new milk-based soft drink. And the faith community in Italian Village and Wineland Park organized to tell their church members, don't go to Bud Derry. Why were they able to organize? Because, oh, North 4th, North 5th, North 6th, and Grant were the only four streets that side of the railroad track that never had prohibitions to prevent people of color from living in those two neighborhoods of Italian Village and Wineland Park. And why was the faith community able to successfully organize what was a social justice boycott through the lens of racial justice? It put Bud Dairy out of business and that was 1935. I love that. That was good. Ooh. All right, back to the white population in red is where the white population is dropping at the fastest rate, Northland, Eastland, Westland. I love the lands, right? All surrounded by the same mall, built by the same developer. Think about the housing stock in those neighborhoods. It's not really new enough to be competitive. It's not old enough to be interesting for gentrification. It's kind of a utilitarian, uh, small rooms, right? And it's aging, but it's still a good value in the marketplace. But as longtime white residents move out of Northland, Eastland, and Westland, they tend to be replaced by new Americans. The fastest drop in the white population, the uh, fastest drop was recorded in Whitehall, where 72% of the white population disappeared in a decade. But you also saw that in Eastland and Northland. And where is the white population going? Right here. That's two houses on St. Clair Avenue on the east side. Two pictures taken from Google Street View in 2010, the same two houses in 2020. Largest growth for white residents is Mount Vernon Avenue and Long Street, the neighborhood with the King Arts Complex and the Urban League is attracting more white residents. We've got some racial musical chairs going on, right? Black households are moving outside the Beltway, white households are moving in, the white households moving in don't have kids. So while the Near East Side's diversity index went from 26 to 42, the Near East Side hasn't been this diverse ever. But the school enrollment isn't budging. Here's a map that shows where the Asian population in Franklin County does not live in red and where the Asian population does live in green. One of the things I'll point out is Northland, where the Asian population jumped from 2,000 to 9,000 in 10 years. Most of that is Nepali Bhutanese. In many ways, you can think of it this way. There's a Nepali Bhutanese community equal to the population of Grandview Heights, now living in Northland, and 10 years ago, it wasn't there. In this map in green is where you see the Hispanic population is growing. And look at the numbers. From just 56,000 to 91,000 Hispanic residents in a decade, and where was the Hispanic community located previously? Whitehall, Northland, the west side. Cultural communities will often choose self-segregation for cultural safety. When you've been in town for a longer period of time, when the community is larger in numbers, they're choosing the same diversity that any of us might choose in our residential patterns. The most diverse place in the entire metropolitan region is behind the Home Depot at West Broad and 270 in the Southwest City Schools. And the picture you see there is indicative of that housing stock, right? It's that simple, solid, 
but reasonably priced housing stock that is attracting diversity. Anybody want to guess what the least diverse place is in the whole region? No, it's not here. It's behind the Whole Foods on Lane Avenue. <laughs> Everybody always laughs at that. Okay. All right, now we're going to get to housing. Uh, this is now something that I believe collectively we now all understand. We're not building enough housing. If you compare Columbus to other similar sized markets, look at Raleigh, smaller market building more housing. We now have the greatest scarcity of units ever recorded. And while housing construction jumped in 2000, or 2020, 21, and 22, we've been stuck at 9,000 units of production every year in my opening, 5,000 less units than what we need. What analysts say is we better be building 21,000 units to dig out from where we are. This map was just published a few weeks ago. The city of Columbus took this issue on because residential construction dropped by 10% in 2023, right when we need it the most. In red is the map of Franklin County where a market rate, stick build, non-elevator building, no longer pencils. If you want to make money with high land, lumber, labor, and interest rates, you now have to get $2,700 a month out of a two-bedroom apartment, or you can't get financing. That's why construction is slowing. What this means is housing is too expensive for those of us that live here. It's not expensive enough for the developers to make enough money, so the city of Columbus has literally just opened up a large number of incentives to jumpstart the lack of production, and they have made tax abatements almost accessible anywhere until the market course corrects. What we're building, what do we need and who are we? We need housing for young single people. We need a lot of apartments. We need large family housing that's low cost for new Americans and we need senior housing. Most zoning codes are not building that. That's why your mayor left early to go address it. In 2010, we had 107 units for every 100 households, meaning at any given time we got seven units sitting empty in the market. Pretty decent housing market. By 2020, we were down to 102. That's why it's so tight. If we don't change our attitudes about welcoming housing, we will be at 96 housing units for every 100 households by 2030. That doesn't seem logical, but places like Denver and Austin, Seattle and San Francisco, they've been there now for a while. This is what's happening with our home values. These were the home values as of May of last year. What you see in red are the top one-third price point communities, and light blue runs that middle one-third tier, and in dark blue runs the most reasonably priced one-third tier. And I'm sure you're all paying attention with Mike Stinziano's lovely letters and emails. What do you see in this chart? Who's up the most? Whitehall, right? Housing vacancy rate plummets from 15 to 4%. They add 2,000 people but lose 365 housing units, Whitehall skyrocketing. Here is a more detailed map, neighborhood by neighborhood, block by block, that shows really where that appreciation is moving at the fastest rate. And what do you notice? Franklinton, south of Children's Hospital, running up that Cleveland Avenue corridor. North Linden's doing pretty well as well. Why are you seeing these neighborhoods respond so significantly? because the value of those neighborhoods has been undercut for decades by redlining, restrictive covenants, urban renewal, highway building, and busing. So for decades, their appreciation just wasn't moving. Now the housing market's not building enough housing. More people are moving inward. So those places that have been suffered with low appreciation are starting to accelerate the lack of gain in a 36-month period. So Franklinton's up 100% in value in 36 months. Every dot on this map is where the city of Columbus issued a building permit, and this shows flipping. In my opinion, we will look back on the early 2020s, and we will judge it with the same type of, wow, that was a bad period, as we look back on redlining. Because brown and black neighborhoods were hurt decade after decade by systemic systems as those neighborhoods were on the decline. Now those neighborhoods are on the rise but many black and brown residents of those communities are still being victimized because they're not homeowners or they won't be able to afford the taxes or upkeep. What that has meant, as recently as 10 years ago, all of our housing costs, apartments, mortgages, 
we're running 2.7 times what you earn in a 12-month period. By 2023, that housing cost is now 4.1 times your annual income. Columbus now has the same income to housing ratio as Chicago. Columbus in white, Central Ohio is in white, we've been polling people from the rest of the state for decades. And that's what it looked like a decade ago. This is what it looked like because of COVID. And what do you see? For the first time in history, Central Ohio is now losing people, not to Dayton or Cleveland or Toledo, but we're losing people to the ring of counties just outside the MSA. Why? If I only have to drive to work two days a week, I can drive a little further. And that ring further out hasn't seen that huge rise in value. What is the housing problem of Central Ohio doing? It's causing a heck of a lot of suburban sprawl and the loss of farmland where we don't need to lose it. And it's also causing people to live doubled up or end up in the homeless system. This is what it looks like now in Central Ohio. Look at Columbus on the far left. In blue is our housing cost. In red, that bar shows our income and the dot is what you need to become a homeowner. Look at where the dot is for Columbus versus on the income. Go to the far right and look at Akron. Annual incomes in Akron are higher than the income you need to be a homeowner. The gap is getting wider and wider and wider here. We're losing affordable housing because of that demand. What we're building is high priced. So rents here jumped 56% in a short period of time, and it's doing this. Starting on the left side of the map, that's eviction filings. Look at 2021, 15,000. 2022, largest number of evictions ever filed in history. 23 was a jump among the record. The middle bar, writs of restitution, that's how many red tags are getting put on doors. That was kept low, but in 2023, there was a gap in when that eviction money was made available. You also started to see landlords that are saying, you know what? I've been here before with you. I'll let you go this time. I can find another tenant. If you look at the far right set outs, in 2022, we only had 744 set outs out of 21,000 evictions. Let me put this number into perspective. That's units. If everybody that got filed on was to lose their housing, every man, woman, and child in Dublin would lose their housing. But we've got money to avoid that. And in May of last year, when the Biden administration did their last round of eviction dollars, they gave more money to Franklin County than the entire state of California. Why? It was a performance-based contract. No community in the country has done better in keeping people stable in their housing than us. Our eviction problem, 60% of that is happening in just a few zip codes. Northland, but look at the east side. It's jumped over Bexley. Where are the evictions? Maine, Livingston, McNaughton, 270. Farther out on the west side. This is about people trying to move up into middle class neighborhoods and then not being able to afford it. The eviction crisis is not Hilltop and Linden. It's not next to downtown, it's moving out. And of course, we've all been following these stories, right? Uh, Galloway Village, Colonial Village, Latitude 525. In the last 13 months, 1,250 units of affordable housing disappeared because of private sector landlords not maintaining the property and taking advantage of low-income people, including the 800 Haitians that were living at Colonial Village, some of them with leases on units that didn't have running water or heat. Pain of fortune. Los Angeles has the lowest ratio of units to people in the United States, and 63,000 people sleep on sidewalks and public parks every night in LA County. In Honolulu, the state legislature gave squatter rights to people in camps like this because the state of Hawaii doesn't know what to do about the explosion of homeless. Portland, Oregon has 1,200 identified camps. They're all over. I met with someone who moved here 18 months ago from Portland, Oregon, who works for Intel. And what he said to me, when I and my wife moved here, we didn't think Columbus had a homeless person. I don't see them. They're everywhere in my city. And they were everywhere in my neighborhood. Columbus has them, right? A little out of sight, out of mind. Here are people sleeping five doors down from my house. I've been in my house for 15 years. I've never had this experience in my neighborhood. You see them in the shadows of the new Wexner Medical Center tower. Here's a camp that I was in next to uh, uh, White Castle headquarters. 
the cost to this community is skyrocketing. As recently as 2015, if you became homeless, it cost us $3,500. By the end of 2022, it was running $12,000. Why? Rents have gone up. Landlords now say I want first month, last month security deposit. We will pay one way or the other to stabilize people in their housing. The question is, do we want to do it with dignity or do we want to let the market run the course? Today was the point in time count. I started at five o'clock this morning going to homeless camps along the Olentangy River. Today was Columbus's day to count every single homeless man, woman, and child. We went to every warming center, every agency where folks go, and we went to all the camps on the land to do that count. When we did it 12 months ago, we learned that the homeless population in this county jumped 22%, but the number of people living on the land between 22 and 23 uh, was up 46%. Here is a list of names. The Thursday before Christmas, we had a funeral service for the 95 residents of our community who died last year while being homeless. So, there's 9,417 less vacant houses than what we had 10 years ago, which means we were able to accommodate about 23,000 people moving into this community that we didn't have to build housing for. We just needed to repurpose what we had. So here's that summary. Regional growth has been consistent with past decades. That growth is moving inward. Neighborhoods that have been losing people for decades are on the grow, whether you can see it or not. Huge increases in diversity. Black households are suburbanizing. White households without kids are moving in. All of our growth is diversity. We're not building enough housing. We're used up our vacant and abandoned housing, and I have every reason to think that our housing costs are just gonna to continue to go up and up and up, and we will continue to take a different path in the woods with the rest of the state, like we've been doing now for 20 years. Here are some pictures to remind you about what a decade can do. Same pictures 10 years apart. Dublin 10 years ago, 10 years later. Henderson Road in the city of Columbus. Two blocks from where I live in the University District. Long Street, heading into the Near East Side. Short North, no surprise, 38 mid-rises have been built from Main and High to Lane and High in a decade. Where Italian Village and Wineland Park meet. So all over the city, we're starting to see this. This is that fifth by west. Fifth Avenue, King Avenue, on the other side of the Olentangy River. What's happening over there? It's responding to the 5,000 new jobs at the Wexner Medical Tower. It's responding to the 12,000 new jobs coming to Lane and Kenny at Carmenton. But we always hear this, right? We need more housing, but it's too tall. It doesn't have enough parking. It's gonna block my sunlight, right? There's always reasons to say no. And when you drive around the city, you start to see it. This is in Sharon Woods on the north side, fighting Airbnbs, which I'll sign up on that one. Salem Village, that's between Morse and 161 on Sinclair, where they were trying to fight preferred living, which was a developer wanting to do apartments. In German Village, they blew up inflatable whales and protested city council. Um, that rendering, by the way, is not to scale. <laughs> If you didn't see it, about a week ago in Dublin, the Dublin schools, Steve knows it, did an opinion piece on their blog where they called this product, which is an Epcon 55 and older senior condominiums, detached single family homes that start at $550,000. They did a blog kind of against it, calling this too dense. When ranch single family homes are too dense, we got a problem. But this is the one I love telling. Berkshire Township near Sunbury, a developer wanted to build 91 houses on 88 acres. And the houses would start at $550,000, starting price, which means they're 650, 700. Residents nearby went crazy. And they organized to stop it. And there were two quotes in a May issue of Columbus, Month, or Columbus Dispatch that said the following. The woman said, 91 houses on 88 acres. Her quote in the dispatch was, how could anybody love their home 
when it's on such a small piece of land? <laughs> Have you been to Bexling? <laughs> like, there's a lot of things you can love, and you're missing all of it. The other quote from an opposition leader, we don't want, this was a quote, we don't want those people living next door to us because they'll just be transient. If $600,000 homeowners, if you can vilify them, you can vilify anybody. Here's a sign in my front yard. I'm part of a group called Neighbors for More Neighbors, right? Density means diversity, people over parking, apartments are awesome. I don't have a parking space, I don't have a garage, neither do the 28 other bedrooms on my quarter block. I can usually find my car. <laughs> but the trade-off is I live in a walkable community and I can go to the grocery store and Barnes and Noble and all kinds of places and I don't have to get on the car, right? All right, I'm gonna wrap this up. It is nothing more complicated than a home is where a job goes at night. We have a collaboration and coordination around economic development that's pretty kick-ass. We don't have that infrastructure around housing. We're gonna continue to grow, there's no debating that. There's four things I wanna end with to give you excitement. By a show of hands, we're gonna do another pop quiz survey. If you know the term link us in five words of what it means, raise your hand. Okay? How many of you know zone in? All right. Affordable housing bonds for the city. I see a lot of the same hands. <laughs> Source of income ordinance. Well, you don't know that one? Link us. This fall, there will be an $8 billion transportation plan on the ballot to finally provide some transportation equity in this community. If anybody want to shout out, when do you think the idea to build 270 was codified in a report? What year? Who are you? you see, are you a council member? Okay, 1953. It opened in 1977. Took 24 years to build, nobody voted on it, and the Columbus Dispatch, when that east leg was finally completed, the Columbus Dispatch called 270 the highway to nowhere. <laughs> but it irrevocably reshaped the urban geography of our city, and none of us ever voted on it. What is Link Us? Link Us is gonna link us with transit, our feet, and bicycles. The big piece of it is bus rapid transit. Not what we got on Cleveland Avenue, which is like bus rapid transit light. We're talking about a double bus connected with that accordion strip. You would get permanent stations in the street. So when that double bus pulls up, all four doors open at once. So you can exit all four doors at once and people can enter all four doors at once like a light rail train because the financial transaction already occurred on the station. Bus rapid transit has signalization. So they speak to the red lights ahead of them and they never stop at red lights, so the speed of efficiency dramatically increases, and then developers can do what? Begin to build walkable, dense development around those stations where you don't have to have cars. Anybody want to shout out, what was the average price in 2023 in the United States for a car payment? You're wrong. 728. Yes, ma'am. That was the average car payment on a new car purchased in the United States in 2023. If you purchased a used car in 2023, your monthly payment was 550. If we continue to build cities where the only thing is you have to have a car to also have a home, what have we done to the economic stability of those families? Link Us is going to help connect that, but Link Us is also about connecting us with better sidewalks. Bexley is freaking amazing because you can get everywhere on your foot, right? There's a lot of Columbus that got annexed in. Think of that whole Steltzer Road, McCutcheon, Steltzer, that whole Northeast getting to Easton. A lot of that was townships that got annexed in, so there's not sidewalks. Think about the human dignity of going to a bus stop when you're in Northeast Columbus and there's a stick in the side of a road with gravel on the berm. There's no dignity in that, right? So it's about finishing sidewalks, it's about bike trails, it's about bike lanes, it's about giving us connectivity. Okay, that's Link Us. Vote for it. Zone in. 
Get it? Zone out, zone in. The city of Columbus has said its zoning code is 70 years old. They have rewritten it and rewritten it in every little piece, but it doesn't work for the city. Zoning codes were really done dramatically in the 1950s. They're very much about the car. They're kind of racist. And the city of Columbus said, we got to get rid of the zoning code. And again, your mayor just left to go address the zoning code, because the zoning code doesn't let us build what we want to build. An example of that would be in my neighborhood in the university district, people want to demolish their two-car garages, rebuild the garage, and put an apartment above the garage. Neighborhood, 100% endorses it. The area commission, 100% endorses it. Well, one person voted no. Planning division loves it. Everybody loves it. You got to get nine variances to do it, and you got to hire an attorney, right? We shouldn't put up those barriers to let people build carriage houses in urban neighborhoods. Zone in will fix that. Affordable housing bonds. You all know bond packages, we vote them, we give the confidence to our public leaders and we say, issue bonds, build roads, bridges, sewer lines, sidewalks and street lights. In 2019, for the first time in history, the city of Columbus put in affordable housing in that bond package and that $50 million in 2019 generated 250 million in construction of affordable housing and the city of Columbus turned that $50 million into 250 million and by a super majority 14 months ago, the voters of Columbus then gave City officials, a $200 million blank check, and this is how they spend, to spend it. And the city believes they'll be able to take that $200 million in voter-backed bonds and build a billion dollars of affordable housing. And while that's amazing, Columbus is only 45% of the metropolitan region. Other suburban communities, in my opinion, should do the same. And then our source of income. Thank you, thank you, Bexley because Bexley was the first city in central Ohio to pass a source of income. Up until a source of income, landlords would only look at your earned income to qualify your eligibility for that unit. They would not include alimony, child support, social security, veterans benefits, and certainly not section eight. Source of income says you as a landlord cannot deny someone based on their legal source of income, meaning federal supports. Bexley showed leadership in September of 2020, passing a source of income ordinance. And since Bexley showed leadership, Columbus, Whitehall, Westerville, Gahanna have followed. Grandview Heights has their hearing, their third hearing on February 5th. It's struggling there, which is a little odd given the high percentage of Democrats in Grandview. So I thank you. Oh, oh. You want to say that to the microphone? <laughs> White liberal people are the worst, except in Bexley, when it comes to <laughs> when it comes to NIMBY. I'm yes. kidding about except. In Do you have an accessory dwelling unit I could live in? Yeah. I think we'd get along. Okay. With that, I know I went long because I never know how to stop. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Follow us, and let's see what's on your mind. Oh, she's going to start clapping in the back already. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Ooh, I went long. No. Uh, if anyone does have a question, please raise your hand so we can get the mic. That way those online can hear as well. And I know it's almost 8, so leave if you need to leave. I'll stay. We'll have some good times. Thank you for that. Um, what have we seen from development of old strip malls and commercial zoned areas to get housing and reform those areas. I know there's d challenges with yeah. zoning, especially with strip malls, the giant Bryce Road and Eastland Mall areas. What, what have we seen, what have you seen? I believe the challenge is not the zoning, it is the lack of interest in market rate housing consumers wanting to live in those areas, and so there's not demand. So if you have these fixed cost, land, lumber, labor, interest rates, if you're gonna build something, you have to deliver it to the market and expect a certain rent. Gender Road and Hamilton Road at Eastland isn't going to command that rent. So in my opinion, the only way you take, and think about this, there is an almost zero commercial vacancy rate on Morse Road. What's the commercial vacancy rate on Hamilton Road from 70 down to refuge? It's terrible, right? So the market's not there and there won't be a market for that retail. So it does need to be repurposed. The city is redoing those capital improvements along Hamilton Road to look at transportation equity. A little late to the party, right? 
But in my opinion, those places need more than a zoning code overhaul to make those strip malls come back to life with a greater purpose. They're gonna need a significant amount of subsidy to get the numbers to work, and we're just not there yet. The other thing about Columbus is, and uh, Bobby Schottenstein's great at this stuff, right? MI Homes builds in 18 markets. He goes to all 18 markets three times a year, and he's 40% of every brand new home that is built in Central Ohio. And he says the reason why he is 40% of all the homes, national builders are just not interested in coming here. He said Columbus is too small of a market. The profit margins are too small. His company, MI Homes, can deliver the same square footage of a house in Metro Houston for $130,000 less than the same square footage he can build in Columbus. And he says the number one difference between his markets there and here is how large his lots need to be in central Ohio because zoning codes and pressure expects that. He said if every place in central Ohio had Columbus's policies, we wouldn't have a housing shortage. And the interesting thing is, right, Columbus has been a large share of the metropolitan growth. But that era of Columbus being a large percentage of that growth is probably gonna shift because where Columbus is gonna see more of that growth is going vertical. And right now, what do you see? Five and six story buildings because those wood frame buildings are what financially makes sense. Once you go above six stories and you go to seven or eight, you gotta go to steel. So if you're gonna go to seven or eight, really eight, you might as well go to 15. Well, you can't get the parking, you can't, land costs aren't high enough. So Columbus is a little kid we're kind of an awkward teenager, right? We don't know where we're gonna be yet, but we're going through a really awkward time period. And that's causing, I think, this consternation. Good question, though. Thoughts? You just went out of here. Oh, yeah. With all that you said, where is all this affordable housing going to be built? And will it meet the needs of the largest sector, I mean, the most common jobs pay $15 an hour or less. Yep. So. Think about this. A registered nurse with two children who make $75,000 a year qualifies for an 80% AMI area median income unit. A construction worker, a, a, fair, a modestly skilled construction worker, single person making 50000 that's an 80% affordable unit. Any one of us that ever goes out to dinner just came into contact with someone who needs a very deep affordable unit because the average annual salary of a cook at a restaurant, a sit-down restaurant, is $29,000 a year. That person needs a 40% AMI unit. Those are really hard to find. Think of hairdressers. Think of people who are running daycare, taking care of our children, people who take care of our parents, right, who then don't have the ability to live. So the point would be is the demographic of who we're talking about is not some undeserving people, right? It's about people navigating that market. If we grow by 750,000 people in the next 25 years, if the current percentage of people who are poor and working poor just stays where it is, that's 200,000 more people coming that are gonna need a below market unit. Where is that moving? Poverty in Central Ohio is moving east. It's jumped over Bexley, right? It's left the Near East Side. It's leapfrogged over Bexley. And now poverty is running out Main, Broad, and Livingston in an unstoppable juggernaut. It's also heading northeast to Westerville. And it's heading out Sullivan Avenue. That's where it's going to continue to go, which means Columbus is going to continue to have the moral and business responsibility to house the region's low-income workforce. And in my opinion, the city of Columbus should not be burdened with that sole responsibility. So Columbus, zoning updates, transportation connectivity, the public citizens investing in affordable housing the way they're doing with bonds and other leverages that the city of Columbus is doing, it is my belief that the adjacent counties and suburban communities need to mirror some of the things that Columbus is doing to prepare for that growth. It's coming, and we're gonna be a very different city. While the white population only fell by 3,000 people, we started last decade 69% white, we ended the decade 60% white. If we continue to change this decade as last, we may not have a racial majority in this county as soon as 2030. We have to get ahead of that stuff, right? If big companies are struggling now to keep full employment, and in a very short period of time, half, and they can't figure out how to do strong diversity, equity, inclusion, and cultural competency, and they can't attract non-white 
folks to work there or feel confident to stay, where are they going to be in the near future, right? So all of these things kind of work together. That was a round the circle answer to your question. There needs to be multiple solutions, but we're not doing enough regionally. I think my strongest answer is the solution to your question is regional. It's not going to come from the feds. It's not going to come from the state. It's going to come from us, and we've been kind of asleep at the wheel. We'll go here and then back. So I understand clearly the need for affordable housing, but in terms of marketing, yeah. affordable housing has to be in neighborhoods where, or in communities where there are other resources, good schools, libraries, parks, transportation, grocery stores. How does that all fit in together in a bigger package? Yeah, so I've got, um, I've got lots of answers, and I've got lots of responses. One would be there is clear evidence that low-income children who live in mixed-income neighborhoods will do better than children in poverty who live in neighborhoods of concentrated poverty. Concentrated poverty is bad for people in poverty and people not in poverty, and that's when you start to see neighborhood systems fall apart. The magic number that I've seen is when a neighborhood's poverty rate hits 40%, that's when the neighborhood really starts to fall apart. Um, Steve has been involved with a group. Uh, oh. Well, then why am I giving you the answer? You know the answer. And that is, right, um, families flourish, move to prosper. The whole idea was what if we can deal with the housing gap and we can take a low income, usually female head of household with children, and support them and they can move to a better neighborhood where there's good schools, where there's transit accessibility, and I appreciate all the work that has gone into your efforts to ensure that those low income working families get to be in better neighborhoods. So what do you see? You see better health outcomes, you see better educational outcomes when people can move to better neighborhoods, and I think that small subsidy that you talk about in providing that rental gap. Bob Weiler and Don Kelly made a lot of money on real estate. What are they doing in their retirement? They decided to create a new company, sell a lot of apartment complexes that they built over the last 30 years, sell them at half off. One of those would be Copper Leaf Apartments on Sawmill Road. They sold the entire apartment complex to a new entity that's a nonprofit entity where the housing authority owns the real estate so they don't have to pay taxes and they can keep those apartment complexes in resource rich neighborhoods and keep the rents low. That's an example of where corporate philanthropy and individual philanthropy is helping to fill that gap. But to your point, it has to be a whole system and series of things. If you look at evictions, that map that I showed you where the evictions are happening in Franklin County. That's where all the elementary schools that we're working with in success by third grade. When you look at the elementary schools with the most number of kids not reading at third grade, it lines up with the geography evictions like lines on a spreadsheet. Is there a direct connection between academic vulnerability of children and the housing stability of parents? You bet. Yes. Um, my experience is that protections for tenants in Ohio are kind of weak, like legal protections and support. Um, is any work being done on that to help maintain rental properties since renters are not going to do things like fix the gutters, paint the, the outside the house, things like that? So the state legislature is not kind to those kinds of things. Um, but I believe you hit the nail on the head with the single word in your question of fear. I know many of you drive up North 4th Street from downtown, you go through Italian Village, you go through Wineland Park, a lot of people look at the changes in that physical neighborhood, and what is the conclusion that you make? Gentrification, 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 all day long. Why do you think that? Because we have created middle class constructs of what we think low income people and what we think low income housing looks like. So I live in a neighborhood that has a 75% poverty rate. My neighborhood is a 9% home ownership rate. On my, within a block of my front door, I have supportive housing, so 60 units of housing for people with chronic homelessness and addiction. I have Section 8 housing, Habitat for Humanity. 
low-income housing tax credits. An illegal house, meaning it has illegal units in the attic and the basement without proper fire code, but the rents are really cheap. And I have a building of all sex offenders, seven buildings away, seven houses away. Uh, a house two blocks from me sold for $30,000 in 2010. It just resold for 650. This connection people have that affordable housing is somehow going to hurt my value, it is just not substantiated in the research. You are correct. People have a fear. What was the picture I showed? Galloway, Colonial, Latitude 525. That was all private sector. That wasn't government housing. It wasn't even nonprofit housing. So when you drive up North 4th Street and you used to have abandoned houses and now you see those brick row houses with the flower boxes, right? And the window transoms and wrought iron railings, it's all still Section 8 housing. I live right across the street from Section 8 housing. It used to be privately owned. Now it is nonprofit owned and managed. Friends would come over and they'd say, oh, how much are the condos going for across the street from you? Nope. It was Section 8 before. It's Section 8 now. The difference is it's now managed by a nonprofit company. If you look at Homeport, Community Housing Network, the Community Builders, Community Properties of Ohio, you could not tell that that is affordable housing. So I think the industry has course corrected some of that fear. We as society have that fear because we're also vilifying the people who live there. Because what has our culture done? It is said, I believe our culture values people who are successful. So if you have accumulated success in material resources, you are somehow a good person. But if you're poor, that's somehow a character flaw, right? We're talking about the people who make sure your parents get their adult diapers changed and take their medication. We're talking about the people who are in daycare centers with your children, and we're talking about the people who work at the restaurants, and they deserve dignity, and someone has to do that job, and it's never gonna pay the living wage to afford the housing costs. So what I would suggest we need to do is no longer say affordable housing, but we have to have a real conversation about housing affordability, and housing affordability now has all of us in a little bit of a vulnerable moment. Yes. Is there anything being done about that to encourage private landlords to maintain their properties? Wow. Or Encouraging a private sector landlord. OK. <laughs> Outside my expertise. <laughs> but what I will say about this, because I live in Columbus, right? And I was, I was, I was walking here from the restaurant. Um, I, was, I was like, oh, like it's nice here, right? Sidewalks are good. Um, you know, Columbus as a city is complaint driven. And so it's not like the city has endless resources where they've got code enforcement officers that don't have anything on their plate. And so in a neighborhood like mine, which has a lot of renters, a lot of absentee landlords, you don't have a system of people who are engaged in reporting some of those things. But as someone who's lived in the city of Columbus for 35 years, when I call 311 and I need things getting taken care of, it gets taken care of pretty quickly. The other dilemma in a neighborhood like mine is, I've got that building on the corner that has seven units that are probably all illegal, and there's some not good stuff going on there, but the rents are like $425 a month, and almost everybody that lives there has some kind of mental health disorder. So in that example, everyone who lives around that property just looks the other way. And we look the other way because if we call code and all the issues of that house get taken care of, that house is going to have to get probably sold and completely renovated. And those seven apartments are going to maybe be a single family home again. I don't want that because I live two blocks off High Street. You can walk to a Kroger. And so it's a moral dilemma, right? There are people navigating unsafe housing conditions like Haitians that come to Columbus and get taken advantage of the private sector. We need to have a stronger public service system. I don't have a lot of confidence in that. Yes? So are the large structures that become vacated, like East Lynn Mall? Let's use the microphone. <clears throat> okay. When there are large structures that become vacated, like East Lynn Mall or um, yeah. <clears throat> Mount Carmel West Hospital, they were already constructed and all that. Is there any way this could be turned into affordable housing? Sure, right? And the city of Columbus, both Northland Mall, Eastland Mall, those examples, that's where, thankfully, 
All the jobs at Tuttle Crossing and Easton and Polaris and Rickenbacker give that city of Columbus that revenue stream. When you look at the most fiscally sound American cities, number one is Austin, number two is San Antonio, Columbus, Ohio comes in number three. We've consistently had that AAA bond rating because we have a large number of um, workers relative to that need. And so the city of Columbus needs the financial resources like that voter approved bond package to purchase those sites, redevelop those sites, and make them available for affordable housing. That is now happening because of those public supported bonds. So we're late to the game, but it's happening. Okay. Public sector won't necessarily mean private sector. Right. Right. And back to the other question. The private sector is not going to Hamilton Road, Kimberly Parkway, Bryce Road. They're not going to Morse Road. They're not going to 161. The public sector is going to show leadership. I will stay to answer any individual and questions. And so we talked him up. Did he disappoint at all tonight? No. And, and he's going to be back February 22nd at 6.30 p.m. I need to write that down. You, you did. <laughs> And you need to tell all of your friends because how many like amazing aha moments did you have in this presentation tonight? It's all happening around us and so many people have no idea that it's going on. So tell your friends, be back here February 22nd and hopefully we'll announce some of our other programs at that point. Thank you again, sir. One last thing, I will make the entire slide deck available. Um, is there a way to do that? Uh, I think we can do that, and I believe that it'll be on YouTube in like another day. Oh, Lord. This whole thing. Okay. This whole thing. And I think we can yeah. probably put the slides in the YouTube and, and oh, yeah, uh, on the library we'll website. The yeah, yep. we'll do the link. Thank so, you. So thank you so much for coming, and let's hear it again for this guy. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Oh, I got to stand back. You're so, you're so great.